Alrighty, so this is the second hour of Physics 1B for November 29th, and now we're going to start talking about what are called standing waves. So standing waves are, um, are found in some pretty common places, I guess you might say. Um, whenever you take a string, like on a guitar, and you pluck the string, those guitar strings are made to have a certain amount of tension and a certain length that will allow them to produce standing waves, and those standing waves will produce the sound that you uh, that you normally hear from a guitar. This is also true of all the stringed instruments and all the wind instruments. So the same thing is true of pianos and uh, bassoons and oboes and flutes and all these different things. So standing waves are at the core of the way that music is produced uh, within instruments. So we'd like to understand how they work, and they don't just show up in music, they also show up in quantum mechanics. Uh, interestingly enough, when you take Physics 1D, you'll learn about standing waves in quantum mechanics. They can also show up in light waves, so they're going to show up in Physics 1C as well. So standing waves, pretty important part of our understanding of how waves work. Now, how do you produce a standing wave, and what is it? Okay, so we just saw that if I have a string and I attach it to a fixed end over here, right? Fixed end. What we saw is that by sending a pulse that looks like this down our string, we found that when it got to the end here, right, it would reflect off and would travel back in this direction. We could call this the reflected pulse if we want to, right? On the bottom. And on the top, this is, would be kind of our transmitted pulse. So imagine that we send a pulse down, it gets reflected back, and then what we do is we send another pulse down that looks just like this, right? What we saw is that this second pulse, so we call this like maybe a second pulse here, this second pulse can interfere with this reflected pulse that's coming back here. Now what you can imagine is suppose that I'm constantly sending pulses down. So I'm oscillating this up and down with, the, with some frequency, F, right? You all, we oscillate. Now we're sending pulses constantly. Pulses are being reflected back constantly, okay? And a standing wave occurs when the process of doing this sets up something that looks like this. So here's our, here's our string, here's our wall. A standing wave is when the pulse that you're sending in this direction is exactly being canceled out by the pulse that's coming backwards. And what it does is it sets up this type of, almost like a pure kind of sine wave uh, on your rope like this, where you're always sending a pulse to the right, there's always a pulse coming back to the left, and in some places the pulses will cancel out with each other, such as at this point, at this point, and at this point. And we call these points nodes. That looks like modes. We call these N-O-D-E-S nodes. This point, this point, and this point right here, okay? The places where there is, con the, at the nodes, this is where destructive interference is happening, where the waves are canceling each other out. The other places, which are here, 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 and here, we call those the anti-nodes. I don't know why they call them that, but they call them the anti-nodes. And what's happening here is that the wave itself is basically waving kind of like this. So each one of these segments is oscillating up and down like this, almost like a jump rope in a way. I always think of standing waves. When I think of standing waves, I always think about two kids that are, that are playing jump rope, like the double dutch kind of thing, where you've got like one rope going one direction, the other rope going the other direction, right? And you're whipping these ropes around. The way that a jump rope looks like that, or it doesn't even have to be double dutch, it could just be, you could have one kid here, right? You could have another kid over here, and they're holding their rope, right? And when you play jump rope, right, what you do is you, you basically swing the rope around like this, right? And it creates this kind of pattern, if you look at it, where the rope is like at the top and then the bottom, and then it's back at the top again and back at the bottom. So the rope kind of like goes around in a circle like this, right? Well, the way that that looks, if you look from the side, it looks like the rope is kind of just moving up and down, which is exactly what the, this is what we call a standing wave. 
And in a way, this is also a standing ray when you have two kids that are, that are playing jump rope. But each of these segments is going to look like a jump rope held between these two nodes. Oh, I left off the ends are also nodes. So this wave would have one, two, three, four, five nodes and four anti-nodes. Okay, so each of these segments is vibrating up and down, but these nodes show up as these fixed points due to the fact that there are going to be places where the traveling wave that comes in is canceled out by the reflected wave going back. Now, I've got some pictures here to show you of this. I don't think the pictures do it justice, though. I think you have to see it in motion. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that we won't be doing a lab with this, but if you took Physics 2A, how many of you took Physics 2A and did the standing wave lab? Do you all remember that? Did anyone here take 2A? I, I have no idea what, why it's not part of the 1B labs. In fact, probably next time I teach 1B when, we have, when we're in person, I'll probably just do the standing wave lab. But this is what they look like. Yeah, you may not have done it. If you did it, you would remember it. It is very memorable because it's very surprising. So what you do in the lab is you literally, you take a string, right? You connect it up to a point. You have a mass hanging over the end to give it tension. Yeah, sometimes you just don't get to it. And what you do is you have a vibrator that you attach to the end right here and the vibrator just like does this. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get it to show up with different modes of the standing wave, okay? So this is an example of what you might see in that lab. You might set the, the frequency up and then you make your length of your string a certain length. And what you do is you basically change the tension in the rope. By changing the tension in the rope, you can change the wavelength because tension is related to speed. And you're basically looking for these different modes. So this would be a situation where the string is exactly one half of a wave. This is where the string is exactly one wavelength long. And what's being shown here is that there's a rope that's basically vibrating up and down. But this is the standing wave where this point basically isn't vibrating, but this points are, right? This would be a situation where you found another mode by maybe changing the, the tension. And now you've got these different nodes here and here's one with four. So nobody, nobody did that lab, huh? It's too bad. Maybe I can try to show you a demo when we do our last lab of how this works. It's kind of impressive. One thing we can do, kind of, kind of, we can almost do it with this. I've always found this to be very difficult to do. Um, I've tried to do this for like 10 plus years now and it never quite works out. But this is generally the idea. So I'm just gonna have this pulse go constantly here. And what you'll notice is that it's not exactly perfect. I was playing with this in between um, here. Let us, uh, a lot, let me show you what happens when there's no damping, just so you can see just how crazy this gets. So we have a pulse here, we have a fixed end. You have to have a fixed end to make this work. It won't work with a loose end. Uh, and we're just gonna have it constantly send waves down here. And because there's no damping, we're gonna get several different standing waves that are gonna appear. Um, I don't know if you could tell, but like, do you see how, it's, it doesn't last permanently, but every once in a while, this becomes a node. Can you see that? It's gonna completely restart the motion here. It's crazy if that happens to me, but it does. So look right there. See how like, I can't even pause it properly. I can go slow motion though, I guess. See how these pieces right here, it's about to get disturbed because there's another wave coming in. But every once in a while, see how there's this kind of standing wave thing that's happening where there's almost a node here and here. See how it just kind of like, the wave kind of stands in place, but then eventually another wave comes through and disrupts it which is what's happening there. But every once in a while, this is kind of looking like a standing wave where there's just this one point, right? And they're just kind of awesome. That's perfect almost right there. Can you all kind of see it? Kind of see the standing wave that's showing up? It's not completely perfect. I found that if I increase the damping here, it can make it look a little bit better, but I don't think I can truly produce a standing wave here. I definitely can produce a standing wave in the classroom just using a big giant slinky. And I can show that to you next time too. At the very least, um, do you all understand what I'm trying to describe with these standing waves? Can you imagine why that would occur? That you send a pulse down with just the right frequency, that the other wave will come back? The idea is basically, you're using a frequency here so that the wave that you send down exactly fits, right? So that this point becomes a node and this point becomes a node. And then what happens is that if the, if the, if the, length of your string is proportional to the wavelength. So in this case, the length of the string would be what? 
how many wavelengths is the length of that string there in the one that I drew? If this is the length, how many wavelengths fit in that length? Equals something times lambda. No, Troy, a wave, a full wave, has to go from top to bottom and then repeat itself. That's a full wave, so it's two wavelengths. So in this case, the length of the wave is two wavelengths. And as a result of that, that guarantees, right, that the, the wave that comes back and the wave that goes forward will be exactly 180 degrees out of phase with each other, right? Because we saw that, that if I send a wave down and it's at a crest at the top, after reflection, it's gonna come back as a trough and that's perfect. That'll, that'll guarantee that we have a standing wave. And it'll end up looking something like this right here with nodes at this point, this point, this point, and obviously on the ends as well. Now we'll do some math with this, but do you all understand the idea? Can you at least kind of visualize like this look? You can, you can do this at your house. You can set up a standing wave. You need another person probably. I think you need another person, I don't know. Take like a long extension cord, hold it between like yourself and like maybe a sibling or a parent or something like that, or a nephew or a friend, whatever. And basically just each of you start like waving the wave, the waving the rope or the extension cord. If you do it properly, you'll start to see standing waves appear. It's not that hard to make it happen. Like I said, I'll show you in class on, well, I think we have a lab this week or an exam this week, but the next time we have a lab, um, remind me to, uh, to show this to you. Okay, so um, let's look at some of the math of how this is gonna work. All right. So suppose that I'm sending a wave down and the incident wave that I'm sending has a, a profile that's something like this. We wanna use sine or cosine? We use cosine. So I'm sending a wave on a string and it has this type of nature to it, right? Um, we'll call this Y1, okay? We send this wave down the string. This wave is reflected off a fixed end. And the reflected wave, we're gonna call Y2 and say that it's gonna be equal to negative A cosine. If I have a wave, that this is a wave that's traveling to the right, right? So this is my incident wave. Um, this is a wave that's traveling to the right, right? This wave has a velocity that's positive V, right? If I wanna get a wave that moves to the left, what do I have to change? I just change the negative sign to a positive sign, right? This will be a wave with negative V. So essentially what we have is one wave coming in and then we have the reflective wave that looks exactly the opposite. What would that look like? Opposite wave would be up and then down. So this is my this is my y1 coming in. This is my y2 coming back. This one has velocity v, this one has velocity negative v. And now they're gonna interact with each other on the same string. And the principle of superposition tells us that the total wave that you're gonna get is gonna be the sum of the incident wave and the reflected wave. So it's going to be a cosine of kx minus omega t minus a cosine of kx plus omega t. And then we can combine these together using one of the, the cosine rules. So let's do that. I don't know these off the top of my head, so I always have to look these up. Um, trig. So the one we want is any of these. So we want, oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, this is what we want, right? Because we have a cosine of a plus a minus b and a cosine of a plus b right here. Okay, so cosine of a, which the first one's minus, right? Minus b is cosine, cosine, sine, sine, and the other one is cosine, cosine, sine, sine with a minus sign. Okay, so the negative one is the plus one. So what does this become? This is going to become, it was cos, cos, sine, sine, right? So this is gonna be a, times cos kx cos of omega t the minus sign is the one with the plus so plus sine kx sine omega t minus a times 
Again, it's going to be cos kx cos omega t, and this one has a minus sign in it, and then it's sine kx sine omega t. Did I do that right? Cos a alpha plus beta is cos alpha cos beta minus sine alpha sine beta. So the plus one, which is this one, should be cos cos minus sine sine. And the other one should be cos cos minus sine plus sine sine. Okay, that looks correct. I think some of this stuff's gonna cancel, right? Um, I think this term, right? And this term are the same. There's a minus sign right here. So we end up getting Tell me if this is right or not. I think you get 2a sine of kx and the sine of omega t. And this is going to be our new y as a function of x and t. Does that look right? Anyone have any questions? So this is the equation for a standing wave. And if we look at it, we can see that it has a frequency omega. It has an amplitude of 2a. But when we look at this term right here, sine of kx, which if you don't remember what k is, k is equal to two pi over lambda, so this is like sine of two pi times x divided by lambda. What, whatever you want, Troy. Yeah, they, they call, the book says a standing wave is equal to two a, but I don't, it's whatever. Uh, what I wanna look at is the fact that we have this term right here, which is the sine of k times x, and we know that that's the sine of two pi x over lambda. So let's draw a picture of our wave now. So now that it's a standing wave, we know that what it looks like is basically we've got a fixed end, we've got a rope, and now we have some kind of standing wave, right? And all I gotta do is make sure that it starts off and ends on a node, okay? So here's my standing wave. I'll draw it with both pieces of it if we want, I guess. So this thing is oscillating up and down. The y coordinate of any point is given by this equation right here, right? So the y direction goes like this. The x direction goes like this, right? Now, if we look at our standing wave, we can ask the question, where are the nodes? So where, as in x equal to what, are the nodes? We could also ask, where are the antinodes, right? Well, looking on this picture right here, what do you notice is true about all the nodes? What do they all share in common? Are the nodes where y equals zero? Absolutely. The nodes occur at y equal to zero. So if we look at our equation here, which says that y is equal to 2a sine of kx times the sine of omega t. Now understand that time is something that's going to, to continue. So t, this thing can be zero from time to time for sure. Okay, And that's because what you have to imagine with these standing waves is that even though I'm drawing this picture like this, the pieces in the middle here are oscillating up and down. And sometimes these will be at zero, right? You just have to imagine that this thing is going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And so sometimes this point right here is at maximum, but sometimes this point's at zero and some points it's a negative maximum, right? Because after all, there's, there's, there's a wave that's being produced over here. It's being sent down. It's just being canceled out by the return wave. Okay, so this piece is going to allow all these things to equal zero from time to time. But if we look at sine of k times x, if this becomes zero, then the whole thing is zero, and there are going to be positions x where you're guaranteed to get y equal to zero, right? So if sine of kx is equal to zero, this is gonna give you a node, always. Do you see the difference between the time and the x portion of this? With the time portion, yeah, sometimes it's gonna be zero, but it doesn't guarantee 
that it will always be zero unless this portion is zero. And this portion will be zero at certain positions x. That's going to give us our nodes. So when is sine of kx equal to zero? It's equal to zero when k times x is equal to what? What does k times x need to be equal to in order for the sine of kx to be equal to zero? What does kx need to be equal to for the sine of kx to be equal to zero? One possibility is zero, right? If kx is equal to zero, the sine of kx is zero. What other possibilities are there? Pi. If you put sine of pi into your calculator, do you get zero? I think so. Um, so pi, and then probably again at 2 pi, and then again at 3 pi. Pi over 2, no. 3 pi over 4, no, but only at integer multiples of pi, right? So we could say in general that this is equal to n times pi, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., right? Or negative 1, but we want x to be positive quantity. So we're basically going to say, let's define this point to be x equal to 0 right here. All right, so knowing that, and this thing went off the screen a little bit here, uh, going back to this definition here, we also know that 2 pi times x over lambda is also what k is equal to, k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. So we set this equal to n times pi, and then um, the, the pi's cancel, and we get that x is going to be equal to, what is it, lambda times pi, no, the pi's went away. Sorry, it's equal to n lambda over 2, I think, right? Does that look right? Yeah, because the pi's cancel, and multiply the lambda, yeah, okay. So at x equal to 0, lambda over 2, lambda, 3 lambda over 2, dot, dot, dot. That's where the nodes are going to be. And if we look at our picture, that's exactly what it looks like on the picture, right? This would be x equal to lambda over 2. This would be x equal to lambda, right? Because that's one full wavelength right there, right? Up and down. So then this point would be x equal to 3 lambda over 2. And this point finally here would be x equal to 4 lambda. Not 4 lambda, 2 lambda. So that's where the nodes are going to occur. And obviously, the ends are also nodes. Does that make sense? you have any questions? I think we can do a problem now. So guitar strings, like I said, standing waves are what are produced. Yeah, let me let me mention something about that here before you go on, actually. Literally, when you pluck a guitar string, what happens is that a standing wave is produced on, on the string. And it's usually it's usually just a, a single like half wave. But there can be little tiny waves inside of it too. So um, yeah. Alright. A guitar string lies along the x-axis when in equilibrium. The end of the string at x equal to zero, the bridge of the guitar is fixed. The bridge would be the part at the top, I guess, where you like tune it. Is that where the bridge is? Now I sound like an idiot if I'm wrong, probably, right? Do any of you play guitar? What is the bridge of the guitar? Is the bridge the name of those like things that you put around your fingers for damping out the sound and for shortening the wavelength or shortening the string length? Or is it uh, the part at the bottom of the guitar that's connected to the bass? I don't really know. For a violin, at uh, the bottom. Okay, so by bottom you mean closer to where the like opening is in the wood, right? Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, anyway. The end of the string, x equal to zero, is fixed. A sinusoidal wave with an amplitude of 0.75 millimeters and a frequency of 440 hertz, corresponding to the red curves in figure 15.24. Oh, 15 what figure is that? 
Um, I guess I can show you the figure. Ugh, I don't like this figure at all. There's a reason why I didn't put this in the... I'm not going to show you it. You're welcome to look at it in your text if you want. I, f I find that it's really hard to... It's just a bunch of waves. It's really hard to read. Okay. Anyway. Um, travels in the X direction at 143 meters per second. It's reflected from the fixed end. And the superposition... Yeah, thanks. I really don't want people looking at that. Can you just remove that picture, Troy? Just delete it. People can look it up if they want to. I don't want people to get confused by staring at that picture. It is not going to help you solve this problem at all. In fact, it's probably going to make it more confusing. I'll draw my own picture. It's reflected from the fixed end, and the superposition of the incident reflected waves performs a standing wave. Find the equation giving the displacement of a point on the string as a function of the position and time. Okay, so we kind of already know what this is going to look like, but uh, let's, let's draw our picture here. So we've got a guitar. Boy, I don't know how to draw a guitar. Oh, that looks even worse. We just kind of come up like this, and I don't know, there's a neck or something. God, this looks awful. I don't know why I tried to draw a guitar. Okay, whatever. So we've got that. We've got our string. So here's the bridge. Here's our string. The string goes in this direction here, up to the top of the guitar. All right, we have a sinusoidal wave with an amplitude of 0.75 and a frequency of this travels along the string in the negative x direction. So, I don't know how I'm supposed to, is, do I have to make flip the guitar around? Is that what I have to do? Does it matter if it's traveling in the negative x direction or the positive x direction? I don't think it really matters, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll do it this way, I guess. So there's a wave going in like this. And what we know is that it has an amplitude A equal to 0.75 mm and a frequency f that is 440 hertz. The wave is traveling in this direction. We're defining this point over here to be x equal to zero, I guess. Ugh, I don't like that at all, but whatever. Um, this wave goes down, it's reflected back. So our wave is gonna be traveling down here and eventually it's gonna get reflected off of here, producing our standing wave that's gonna kinda go back like this. Oh, but that's that's misleading, isn't it? We'll leave this on here for now, because the standing wave is going to have twice the amplitude of this one, I think. All right, so we have to find... Oh, we also know velocity. Velocity is equal to 1, 4, 3, m over s. And part a says to find the equation, giving the displacement of a point on the string as a function of position and time. All right, so what we know from what we just arrived is that that equation is going to look like this. It's going to be 2 times the amplitude multiplied by, what was it, sine of kx times the sine of omega t. So it's going to be twice the amplitude, so 2 times a, which is 0.75 times 10 to the negative 3 meters, multiplied by the sine of k times x. So how, we got to find k, right? So if we have velocity and frequency, we can find wavelength because velocity is equal to wavelength times frequency. So wavelength is equal to velocity divided by frequency. So this is going to be 143 divided by 440. So I got a wavelength of 0.325. Okay, so then to find k, k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. If we plug in those numbers, I get 19.33. Um, this is inverse meters. Okay, so our equation now, let's make some more room here was 2a, there's a, times the sine of k times x. So we're going to put in here 19.33 inverse meters times x. There we go. And then the sine of omega times t. So to get omega, 
omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. So that's going to be 440 times 2 times pi. This one's 2764. That's radians per second. So times the time. That's basically our equation. I mean, I can I can multiply this through. This 2 times 0.75 is going to make it 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3, but then the rest of it's exactly the same. Just copy-paste it. So there we go. That should be our equation. Any questions? No, your book uses... Uh, radians per meter for this. I guess that's technically the right unit. I should use the same thing that they do. So this should be radians over meters. And then in here, same thing. Put it in a different color indicating what I changed. This is radians over meters, RAD over M. Okay. So that's the answer to part A. Part B locate the nodes. So the nodes will occur uh, again when this quantity here is equal to zero, but they're also going to occur as we said before at every half wavelength, right? The nodes occur every half wavelength. So what's our wavelength here? Our wavelength is 0.325 meters. How long is the string? infinitely long. Uh, am I crazy? Did they not give a length of the string here? Um, oh, they don't tell us the length of the string, but we're supposed to just, okay, yeah. Every half wavelength, right? So the nodes occur at x equal to 0 and lambda over 2 and lambda, etc. So it's going to be 0. OK, what is lambda? 0.325. So half of that is 0.1625. Then the next one will be at 1 wavelength, so 0.325 meters and so on and so forth. You all can, can fill that out. So those are the nodes. Part C says, find the amplitude of the standing wave, well, we already did that, and the maximum transverse velocity and acceleration. Okay. Maximum transverse velocity, we can just, that's Vy, right? Transverse means the velocity perpendicular to the wave direction. So these should be pretty easy to do. So part C, we want to find the maximum transverse velocity. So that's going to be Vy max. And to get Vy, what do we do? We just take the derivative of this, right? So this is going to be the partial derivative of y with respect to t. And then we just need to maximize it. So if we take the partial of y with respect to t, that's going to be the derivative of this piece. Everything else doesn't have a t in it, so we'll have, oof, I hate doing this kind of stuff with numbers in it, but we'll just do it anyway. So this times, when I take the derivative of the sine here, I'm going to get a cosine, and I'll also get this term out in front, so we need to multiply by 2, 7, 6, 4 radians per second times the sine of kx. times the cosine of this. So to find the maximum speed, oh, there's a t here, right? What do I need to do to find the maximum speed? 
What do you all think? Because I have an X here, and I have a T here, so how am I going to maximize the speed? What do you think? X distance at the end of the... Well, we don't really even know where this string ends, by the way. So unless you mean this point right here. If you look at that point, that point's not moving. It's not going to be the maximum speed right there. That point's not moving at all. Not moving at all. Which points, if we look at our wave on a string here, which points do you think are going to have the maximum speed? We know that these points have a speed of zero, right? Transverse speed, y velocity of these are zero. Can everyone see that? They're not moving. This point definitely isn't moving. Or the anti nodes, yeah. So this is where you're gonna get the most speed. Right here. At the anti nodes, because that's where the, the, the string is vibrating up and down and up and down and up and down, right? So we're gonna get max speed. at anti-nodes and at the anti-nodes that's where the sine of kx is equal to plus or minus one so we don't need to worry about that term we know that the, the high speed is going to occur when this is one right and then once we once we've determined that we know the maximum value that this can be is also one it's the biggest that it can possibly be so that means that V max should just come from these first two terms here. So it should be 1.5 times 10 to the minus three meters multiplied by 2764 radians per second. I think that should be the answer, right? Should be. Equals 4.15. And I guess it's technically plus or minus as well, because this the max this could be is plus or minus one. So we can put a plus or minus in front of this. So it's gonna be plus or minus four point one five meters per second. Okay, that's the maximum transverse speed. And we also want to find acceleration. How are we doing on time? Not super great. How much more do I have to do? I think we had two problems left to do, right? So we'll leave the acceleration as something you can do. It's going to be the exact same concept. You're just going to, we're going to take the derivative of uh, this equation, which is our velocity equation. You get the acceleration, and then the maximum acceleration is going to be whatever's out here in front. So it's going to be um, 1.4 times, this is going to be this times this squared. Whoops. This right here times this squared is what the answer is going to be. Basically, a times omega squared. All right. So the last thing to talk about in this chapter are what are called normal modes. And this is the idea that the string can be vibrating in one of many possible modes, okay? And if we think about it, what those modes look like is this. Um, the, the, what we call the fundamental mode is when you have just one half of a wavelength We're going to use this as the n equal to 1 mode. And this is where we're going to have fixed end here and just basically a half wave. So this oscillates up and down like this. You have exactly one anti-node and two nodes. So here we have two nodes and one anti-node right here. So the nodes are on the ends. And we also know, if you look at this, that the length of our string from here to here L is equal to half of a wavelength, right? We can then go into the second mode. Sometimes I think this one's referred to as the first harmonic. So fundamental mode, I think, I think n equal to two is the first harmonic. Okay. To give you a little history of this that I learned about when I was in school, these kinds of things were discovered by ancient, any ancient civilization you can look into discovered this, but the, the one that I studied was ancient Greek civilization 
where basically they figured out that if you take a string, right, like this, and you, you, you hold it between two points like you would on a, a lute or a guitar or something like this, and you pluck it, you're going to get a certain frequency, okay? Um, and if you then take exactly the same string, right, exactly the same string, but instead of plucking it like this, if you hold your finger here in the middle, right, and now you pluck one side of it, well, now only that side is going to vibrate. You'll get a standing wave on that side. Um, and then maybe you could have somebody else pluck this side, and um, you could produce the second mode. And what's interesting about this is, what do you all know about this, um, those of you that have some experience with music? What happens if I take a string and I pluck it, and then I cut the string in half, and then I pluck one side of it, what happens to the pitch? Does it go up or does it go down? It produces a higher tone. How much higher, Matthew? Do you know exactly how much higher it is? So what he's saying is that if I pluck a string like this, you can you can actually try this with, if you maybe if you have some like fishing line around your house, you can try this with a fishing line. So take some fishing line, hold it tight between two points, have someone pluck it, right? And then cut the fishing line in half and then pluck it and listen to it. It will be a higher sound. How much higher is it, Matthew? Do you know? Or does anybody else know? So if this has a frequency of F, it's going to be higher by a factor of two, yeah. This is going to be a frequency of 2F. Um, it's sometimes referred to as one octave higher in music. You go up one octave. It's like going from on a piano if you're at like, if you push like the middle C key and you go up eight notes higher to the next C, they say that's one octave above, right? And interestingly enough, if you take a, if you take a string and you pluck it and you cut it in half and you pluck it, it'll be exactly one octave higher, which turns out to be double the frequency in math, but they didn't know that back then. They just knew that it sounded higher and it was exactly one octave higher. So we call that the first harmonic and we can just keep going from here. Um, I'll draw a couple more of these. The second harmonic, I know that these are numbered kind of weird, but it's from a historical perspective, I believe. It's called N equal to three, right? And for this one, what you're gonna get is four notes. But notice the important thing about this is that the wavelength is always directly proportional to the size of the string. So in this case, the length of the string is going to have three half wavelengths. So three lambda divided by two. There we go. Turns out the frequency of this one, I believe, will be three times f, right? So we can come up with a general equation for this, which is that n equal one, n equal two, n equal three, l equal to lambda over two lambda, three lambda over two. You can kind of see the pattern probably that uh, the length of the string is equal to n times lambda over two, right? And we can kind of go farther here. Uh, sometimes the way this is also written that lambda sub n is equal to two L over n. And now we also know that there's some, some frequencies associated with these, right? We know that frequency is equal to velocity of the wave divided by wavelength, right? So if I put that together with this right here, we're gonna get that frequency of the wave is what is it going to be? If I take V over lambda, that's going to be N times V over 2L, right? N times V over 2L. So this gives us our frequencies. And do I want to put the other piece of this in here? We learned earlier that V, right, was equal to the square root of F over mu. And now with this, you know enough to, to build a guitar, basically. Contained with this, with this an equation is like how any stringed instrument works, um, where it says the frequency that's produced is equal to the square root of the tension in the rope divided by the mass density, and then multiplied by this thing, n over 2L, right? So suppose you want to produce a certain frequency. Like, for example, I think... Um, I think middle C, the frequency of C is, uh, it's either 512 or 256. I never remember. I think it's 256 though. 256 hertz is a frequency that we call C in music, I think. I could be wrong about this. I haven't studied music in a long time. So you could figure out exactly what these quantities need to be to produce this frequency. And to the, the real thing that you need to know about this is that if you wanted to design a stringed instrument, you're going to start off by just using n equal to one 
what happens is that when you pluck a string, the main vibration mode of the string, so we're talking about normal modes on the string. When we say mode, we mean the mode of vibration, right? Here on the right, I have three different modes of vibration, right? Either, you can't see what I'm doing, so I guess I can do like this. This is a mode we call the fundamental mode, and we call it the fundamental mode because if I take a guitar and I pluck one of the strings, it's going to vibrate in this mode right here. Nat it's going to naturally want to vibrate just in this mode, okay? What's going to happen is that while the string is vibrating in this mode, the string itself is actually going to have multiple modes vibrating all at the same time, even though this is the primary one you're going to hear. And we call these overtones in music, where there's a specific frequency that you're producing. Let's say that you're, you're playing a string and it produces this frequency here. It makes a C note. You don't just hear that one frequency. You hear what are called overtones because the string has little tiny vibrations that are made up of these other frequencies as well. And that's kind of what gives a richness to music that's played with like acoustic guitars compared to when you hear just a pure note produced by a computer or something, right? Like you can make a computer produce this note, right? And then you can go get a guitar string and you can produce exactly the same note, right? But they will not sound the same, right? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Let me see if I can show you what I mean. Uh, is this gonna work? So suppose we wanna produce a sound that's 256. Let's see if I was right about that, right? Let's see, 256 is middle C, so I was correct about that. So, oh, can you even hear this? Tell me. Yeah, I can barely hear it. There's no way you can hear it. Where's this volume on this? There's the volume. Right, uh, compare an electric piano to a real piano. The real piano, when you play it, it's almost like the, the sound created by a real piano will kind of just, I don't know, it, it, you can kind of feel it in the room. It, it kind of like takes over the air of the room. Um, and then you, you compare that to what you get when you play an electric piano, and it's going to sound kind of different. But something to understand, Matthew, is that e even then, the electric piano is often trying to, to mimic a real piano. So probably the people that, that make those electric pianos, they're going to try to make it sound like a real piano, which means it will have some of these overtones and stuff, but it won't, but it's generated by, you know, electronics, so it can't be perfect. Um, I can barely hear this. Is this the volume? No, that's the frequency, right? This isn't very useful. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe one of these other ones is a little bit louder. Whew, this was, that's a little bit too much. Anyway, I think you all kind of understand what I'm saying. Let's, one of these has to be good, right? I can, I can barely hear that. Can you all hear it at all? I think it's because I'm uh, streaming, honestly. I think the Discord's doing something to shut down those sounds. Because I can barely hear it at all. Anyway, my point being that real instruments sound different than computers. And the reason why is because when you pluck the string, you get a lot of overtones and that, that gives the music kind of like a richness or a fullness. Okay, so um, let's say one more thing about this here, which is looking back at this equation here, um, F sub one, so I should, I should write this as F sub n, F sub one is just equal to V over two L, right? And that means that F sub n is equal to N times F sub one. I have memory that this equation ends up being pretty helpful. And um, yeah. What else is there to say? I don't think there's anything else to say. Um, we could talk about, the, the book doesn't do it, but um, we could also talk about the way that, um, st oh, I know why it doesn't do it. It's because we're gonna talk about it when we talk about sound. We're gonna talk about when we talk about sound. So we're just talking about strings right now. Later on, we'll talk about how oboes work, but it turns out that depending on whether you have a string, a, a wind instrument where it's open at one end versus closed at one end, when it's closed at one end, you're gonna get this. When it's open at one end, I think there's gonna be a four down here. Anyway, so let's look at the two problems that I have. I think we have time to solve them. We have about eight minutes. These problems are not that difficult. I hope I set that up well enough for you that we can solve these and you won't be too lost. Uh, I want to mention one other thing here before we keep going. Let's look at that equation and talk about it for just a second. Okay, this says frequency produced is equal to this quantity right here, right? Make this equal to one, so we're not going to worry about it, right? 
what happens to the frequency of the wave as the as the length of the string gets longer? The longer the string, higher frequency, right? Yeah, I think that's right, Astral Over, exactly. The difference between like EDM and live country music. Yeah, even if you really, really hate country music, you have to acknowledge that it, it does have a different sound than EDM, right? I like both. I like EDM music and I like country music, but there's definitely a different sound to those kind of concerts that you would go to. Okay, so longer length, lower frequency, exactly. So a really long string is going to pr produce like a really low sound, like a, a deep bass sound. And a really short string, if you pluck it, it's going to be a really high pitch sound. What else shows up in here? Tension in the string, that's F, right? So if any of you have ever tuned a guitar or piano before, you know that if you increase tension in the string, it's going to make the frequency higher, right? And then finally, this piece right here, mass density shows up in the denominator. If you look at a guitar, a guitar has usually, what is it, six strings? And the strings on the bottom, relative, like so if you're holding a guitar with your left hand, the strings on the bottom are really skinny, right? So skinny means that they have low mass density, and that means they're going to have higher frequency. And that's the case, the strings on the bottom of the guitar have a higher frequency than the strings on the top of the guitar. The strings on the top of the guitar are very thick. In fact, if you look at them closely on a lot of guitars, they'll be like this kind of wire wound thing. Um, but the thicker strings produce lower frequencies, right? If you go into a bass guitar, if you look at a bass guitar, so a bass guitar usually has like four strings, I think, right? And the difference between the strings on a bass guitar versus a regular guitar is the strings on the bass guitar are really, really thick. And because they're really thick, they can produce really low frequency bass sounds, which is what you want from a bass guitar. Does that all make sense? Is that all consistent with your experience? If it's not, you should go pick up a guitar and play with it. And you will see that all those things are true. Okay, so um, giant bass violin. Okay, so an attempt to get your name in the Guinness Book of World Records, you build a bass violin. Wait, is a viol like a different than a violin? Maybe it's maybe it's, maybe this is the name of one of those big stand-up bass violin. I don't know. A bass viol with strings of length five meters between fixed points. One string with a linear mass density of forty grams per meter is tuned to twenty hertz fundamental frequency, the lowest frequency that the human ear can hear. Uh, we haven't talked. We're going to talk about you know, sound in the next chapter, and we'll talk about the frequency of which you can hear something. We'll also talk about the the frequency at which you're going to feel pain. But 20 hertz, very low bass sound, one of the lowest we can hear. This is uh, a little bit misleading. It depends on the volume, actually. We can hear really low frequency sounds as long as the volume's really high. Anyway, um, we want to calculate the tension in the string, the frequency of the wave, frequency and wavelength on the string of the second harmonic and the frequency and wavelength of the second overtone. Okay, this is where I gotta make sure that your book uses the same. I didn't see the word harmonic, here it is. These frequencies are sometimes called harmonics. And the series called a harmonic series. Musicians sometimes call F2 and F3 and so on an overtone. So F2 is the second harmonic or the first overtone. Okay, so I, I lied to you. This is the second harmonic and this is the third harmonic. That's what they're saying at least. F2 is the second harmonic. Okay, so I lied. This is the second harmonic. This is the third harmonic. But this is the first overtone. And again, overtones is the fact that when you pluck these strings, you actually hear all of these. Second overtone. Okay, so just to get those uh, um, out of the way. All right, so we're given that we have a string with a length of five meters and it's held between fixed points, which is kind of what we need. We know that the linear mass density mu is equal to 40 grams per meter. And it's tuned to a frequency of 20 hertz. And part A says we want to find the tension on the string as well. So for this, we'll have to use our frequency is equal to um, n over 2L square root of f over mu, I'll just call it t over mu. So we want to solve for t. We're going to say let n equal to 1. All right, and why do I have let equal to n equal to 1? Because f1, it says it's tuned to 20 hertz fundamental frequency. So that f, that's f1, so that means I can use m1. So then we can solve for t. So we're going to get 2lf over n is equal to root 
t over mu, square both sides, we'll get 4 l squared f squared over n squared times mu should be equal to the tension. So this is going to be 4 times the length, which is 5 meters, frequency, which is 20 hertz, to square both of those. We'll divide that by n squared, which is 1, and then multiply by mu, which is 40 grams per meter. Now, since this is in grams per meter, we're going to want to convert that to kilograms, so it's going to be 0 0.04 kg over m. And that should work out. Yeah, this is going to give us this will give us a kilogram times one meter and then a second squared in the denominator, which is what we want. We can probably do this on our heads. That's 400. That's 25. 25 times 4 is 100. So 100 times 400. And this is 4 over 100. So this will cancel out with that. So it's 4 times... Oh, I'm, I'm lying. No, I'm not. That's 100. So it's 4 times 400. Right? Is that, is that right? It's the standard version of violin. That makes sense. Thank you. Longer L, smaller frequency. These are like these those really big stand-up bases. You get 1,600 newtons. I guess we can, we can see what the textbook on. Yeah. They also say that that's 360 pounds. Okay, so that's our tension. That's part A. Part B says the frequency and wavelength of the on the string of the second harmonic. Okay, so there's a couple ways we can do this. For part B, the frequency and wavelength on the string of the second harmonic. Okay, so to find the wavelength, lambda sub n is just 2L divided by n. So that's 2 times the length of the string, which is 5 meters. And now we want to find lambda 2. Right? So this is going to be 10 over 2, so 5 meters. That makes sense, because the second harmonic is the one where you have exactly one wavelength, right? This is lambda 2, or n equal to 2. Um, the frequency and wavelength, so we want frequency as well. So this is where we can use the handy equation that f sub n is equal to n times the fundamental frequency. And in this case, we have n equal to 2, and the fundamental frequency was 20 hertz. So we get 40 hertz for F2. And then part C says the frequency and wavelength of the string of the second overtone. So for C, second overtone is going to be n equal to 3. And we just go through and do exactly the same thing again. So lambda sub n should be equal to 2 times 5 meters divided by 3. So in this case, that's going to be 3.33 meters. And then to find the frequency, f sub 3 should be equal to 3 times f sub 1. So this is going to be 60 hertz is f3. Anyone have any questions? Pretty straightforward. What's this one? What are the frequency and wavelength of sounds produced in air when the string in example 15.7 is vibrating at its fundamental frequency. Well, we know the frequency was the fundamental frequency, which is 20 hertz. And the question is, the frequency and wavelength of the sound waves produced in the air Well, the frequency is going to be the same. I think. But to get the wavelength, we're going to have to take the velocity divided by the frequency, I think. So if we take V, which is 344 4 meters per second, and we divide by the frequency of 20 hertz, then we get the wavelength. 344 4 divided by 20. 
So you get 17.2, and that is in meters. Is that really the whole problem? That's the whole problem. Okay. Well, we have this whole next chapter about sound waves, so I guess we'll get into more detail about this stuff next chapter, but there we have it. That is standing waves on a string. I find this to be one of the kind of neatest things in physics, honestly. It, it, it comes up a lot. Like I said, it shows up in music, obviously, which is a pretty, you know, popular thing. People like music. I like music. Um, but it, And it's nice to understand how, like, a stringed instrument can produce music and how there's math behind it, too. I find that to be really cool. I, I, I don't know why, when I was in college and I saw this demo for the first time where you take a string and then you, you, you it makes a sound and you cut it in half and it literally produces a sound that's one octave above, that really blew my mind when I saw that for the first time. I was like, wow, that's so simple. You know, it's like, uh, it's really nice seeing these connections between um, the length of a string and the kind of music that it produces, right? And then seeing physically where that comes from um, and knowing that it's just about fitting waves inside of a certain length. All right, I'm good. I'm going over. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, we, we do have a, a test this week. I think I told you it's only going to cover chapters 18, 19, and 20. I'm not going to put any of this wave stuff on here. I'll just put all the wave stuff on the final, which means most of the final will be a bunch of wave questions. And, uh, and that's that. So I hope you all have a good day. I'll see you all in class on Wednesday. And uh, yeah, hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Take it easy.